A very warm welcome to everyone joining us today for the second session on day five of Insight 2022. My name is Abby Muller and I work within the evaluation team in the strategy unit. In this session, I had the pleasure of speaking with the very inspirational Professor Bola Aulabi. Before we start, for those that are joining for the first time, and a reminder for everyone else, this is the Midlands Decision Support Network's annual festival, which brings together a diverse lineup of expert speakers from across health and care. The festival started this week on Monday 21st of November, and it will run until the end of next week, Friday 2nd of December 2022. This year's focus is on the science and craft of decision making. Within this, we are exploring what high quality decision making looks like and how staff across health and care can make the best use of the analysis that is available to them. So with no further ado, let me introduce Professor Bola Aulabi. Bola has many professional roles. She is Director, National Healthcare Inequalities and Improvement, the NHS England Senior Responsible Officer for Digital Inclusion, an Honorary Professor at the University of Birmingham, and she is also a GP in the Midlands. Welcome, Bola. The topic under discussion in this session is, if we are to reduce health inequalities, what decisions are needed and how should they be made? So for the first question, Bola, if I may, at the time, what were your observations on how health inequalities had been tackled in the past? My sense from listening to people is that the conflation of health inequalities and health care inequalities made the subject so vast and the analysis so extensive that what happened is people were overwhelmed by the complexity and the vastness of the challenge. And as somebody said, I think we found ourselves in a degree of paralysis by analysis. I think we found ourselves in a position of what Rob Webster in West Yorkshire would describe as admiring the problem excessively and not moving rapidly into what can we do. I think the conflation of those two things also created a degree of inertia where people like me sitting here as a GP felt powerless in terms of what can I do about housing? What can I do about education? What can I do? about people's employment prospects. And I think that feeling of powerlessness created a sense of inertia, particularly amongst frontline healthcare professionals like myself. That was the first thing that I learned from that deep listening, the conflation of the two. The second thing I learned was in an attempt to try and tackle all of health inequalities. Our energies were being dissipated in so many directions that it was challenging to be able to demonstrate impact in any particular aspect. And I learned very quickly, therefore, that in order for us to make progress, we needed to clarify direct responsibility and accountability versus contribution and influence. That's the first thing. And the second thing we needed to do was develop an approach that would force us to focus and hopefully gain some traction. And with that comes the prospect of being able to achieve measurable impact over a reasonably sensible time frame. Those were the things I learned and those were the approaches that I tried to 
develop with my team and so many people across the country. And I'm happy to talk in more detail about what that meant practically. Um, please do so. Uh, and uh, so how, I guess the next question to follow up is how did you do that? As, how did you progress, proceed at that national level? How did you build your team um, to both overcome those, those two points that you made around the inertia um, and the kind of the, the, uh, the energy drain um, by being um, spread out a bit too thinly? Sure. So um, can I just say that we are very much still at the foothills of this? We haven't cracked it. Health inequalities haven't been overcome. Um, it's really important to put that note in the room. So I will talk about the fact that what we are doing is trying a different approach so that we're not going around the same circle and expecting a different outcome. So in terms of clarifying responsibilities, accountabilities, and so on, we began to say, in relation to health inequalities broadly, what is the role of the NHS? And we said the roles of the NHS are fourfold. First of all, the NHS as a commissioner and provider of services is able to construct our contracts our service specifications, our guidelines, in a way that insists on the narrowing of health inequalities through the KPIs and the metrics and so on that we set. So that's the first thing we can do. The second thing is the NHS as an anchor institution. In many of the communities where we operate, the NHS is the anchor institution. My surgery will be the last place standing when everybody else has left. And so there's a very powerful anchor role the NHS plays. And in that anchor role, the decisions we make in terms of employment, in terms of procurement, how we buy, how we use our estate, those decisions can have a direct bearing on health inequalities. Thirdly, the NHS as the largest employer in this country and actually to some degree globally, our recruitment practices, the opportunities that we give to those from underserved communities, as I saw in evidence at Mid and South Essex um, NHS Foundation Trust, in Birmingham and so many other places across the country, the NHS as an employer has a very powerful leverage um, in, in, in narrowing the health inequalities gap. And the final fourth dimension in terms of the role of the NHS as a key partner within the integrated care system. So working alongside our colleagues in the local authority, our directors of public health, our voluntary sector organizations, the charitable sector, the allyship that we can build through that integration. Those four dimensions demonstrate the roles of the NHS in tackling health inequality. So that was the first thing we did was to describe it. What can the NHS do? In relation to health care inequalities, we looked at the data. So if you look, for example, at the Commonwealth Global Burden of Disease Survey and Public Health England segment tool, the slope index of health inequalities, and you begin to triangulate those data warehouses we obtained a powerful insight, which is the fact that there is a social gradient to most of the healthcare inequalities that we see. And it was through that process and talking to lots of people across the country that we ended up with the core 20 plus five vehicle. 
And what Core 20 plus 5 is about is saying, if we can focus on the Core 20 plus population group, the 20% most deprived by the index of multiple deprivation using the national data, the Core 20. And we allow each of the 42 ICSs to use their population health data and identify their plus population group. It could be, you know, asylum seekers, people experiencing homelessness. We end up with the core 20 plus population. And then we drive hard after five clinical areas responsible for the largest premature mortality or disparities in mortality. And we drive secondary prevention interventions in those five clinical areas. So cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, maternity and mental health. So we've tried to use the data to craft an approach for tackling health care inequalities in addition to our contribution with partners to tackling health inequalities. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Abala, for talking us through what um, the ambition um, in, in terms of what you want to do. What's the ultimate aim in terms of what, what are the goals that you've set yourself? Um, I appreciate that you're in the foothills, but where do you see yourself? Um, where do you see the national status and health inequalities in, in, in a few years time? I think there are a whole range of ways by which we can hold ourselves to account in terms of delivery. So the government said in the manifesto, and it was repeated in the NHS mandate and repeated in the leveling up white paper, mission seven of the leveling up white paper, the health mission is that what we want to do is to narrow the gap in healthy life expectancy by 2030 and across the population increase healthy life expectancy by five years by 2035. Many people will say that ambition is incredibly stretching and I agree. I also believe that because it is stretching then it forces us to accelerate and it forces us to focus because in order to achieve that stretching goal, we have to focus. So for me, the way we're going to know whether we have achieved our aim is to what extent have we indeed increased healthy life expectancy by 2035. The second is across the five clinical areas that I've described, to what extent have we achieved the overall goal that the NHS set out in our long-term plan published in 2019, which is being refreshed at the moment? To what extent have we achieved the overarching goals in a way that actually really prioritize the core 20 plus population group? so that we not only achieve the overall goal, but we do so in a way that has lifted the floor, not just raised the ceiling, as my principal analyst, John Britton said, if you just elevate the ceiling and leave the floor where it is, we will have succeeded in widening health inequalities. So if we have achieved our overall long-term plan goals and the leveling up health mission by elevating the floor for the core 20 plus population group, that will be the test of whether or not we have indeed narrowed the health inequalities gap. 
Thank you for that, for that Bala. Um, before we move on to um, kind of probe about the, the kind of the, the, the responsibilities of ICS, I just want to, uh, I'm going to ask you to put us into the international context. What you're doing nationally um, in England, how does that compare um, in that context? Um, are, are we making more progress? Can we pat ourselves on the, on the back? I think there are lessons that we can learn um, if we reflect on the COVID-19 pandemic. I think in terms of, you know, the development of the vaccines, for example, we were world leading by every standard. Um, I also think in terms of how quickly we recognized where our gaps were. Again, there was some really important work that happened there. So in January 2021, you know, I would, I, I, I'm trying to think about other comparisons. We began to disaggregate our data very early in January 21 and began to see the inequalities in vaccine uptake. And actually the fact that we mobilized a huge response by making the vaccines available through multiple channels to the communities at the margins. I actually think that we have a lot to be proud of in that we were humble enough to find our gaps and begin to narrow the gap. I think there's always a lot that we can learn in terms of how we proactively build those health equity lenses into what we do right from the outset. I'm sure that that's something that we will be taking forward. The other thing that I think we can reflect upon is how we took the communities with us. I remember along with other NHS leaders and indeed our, our directors of public health who played an enormous role in this space the conversations with our faith leaders, our community leaders, getting their wisdom in what works. Again, that principle of co-production, I believe we did really well. Going forward, I do think that we can do even more by systematically creating a virtuous circle of data across all our services where we consistently disaggregate the data, at least by deprivation and by ethnicity. We surface the inequalities and we use the insights that we get to drive tangible interventions and drive improvement and gain intelligence about what works and keep doing what works. So I think by comparison, there are things we did well. There are things that we can do even better, um, even as we go forward by learning and codifying what we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Great, and thank you for giving, you know, uh, for um, talking us through what we did well um, within the COVID pandemic and how we can learn from that. Um, if we change the uh, the kind of the focus onto ICSs, you've referenced them already. In terms of an, and as uh, you know, as the national health inequalities agenda moves uh, a little bit more regionally and, um, and and system wide, what are your suggestions on how health and care systems proceed into taking some of this national and international insight into action? Absolutely, I think the integrated care systems are most definitely our greatest hope right now um, for making significant inroads in terms of health inequalities. And you will know from the ICS white paper that there are four purposes why the ICSs were set up. And one of those four is to address inequalities in access, experience and outcomes for their population. So that's a great start. The fact that actually the fundamental purpose for which the ICS has been set up includes tackling health inequalities. That's a great place to start. I think secondly, the fact that we've set out five strategic priorities from a healthcare point of view, which we can work with our partners on. 
priority one is to restore our NHS services inclusively. So as we work on our electives waiting list, we can work with our ICS partners to restore inclusively as they did at University Hospitals of Leicester, where they disaggregated their respiratory outpatient did not attend data. And they saw the inequalities in that and they worked with their ICS partners, with their volunteers to reach the communities, to understand why people were not turning up and they reduced the DNA by 50%. So to restore our NHS services inclusively. The second thing, to mitigate against digital exclusion. So through the course of the pandemic, we've had to go, I had to go onto video consultations. You know, we had to go to online consultations and digital, digital has the prospect to be a powerful enabler and accelerant for tackling health inequalities if we handle it well. And so as the ICSs go forward, and I've seen some great examples across the country where they're setting up cafes. So again, you know, when I was in Mid and South Essex, they had the community hub where they were training people coming off the street in digital um, capabilities. That means they could go on to find work. So mitigating against digital exclusion. The third priority is to ensure that our data sets are timely and complete, particularly ethnicity coding. Because without a robust underlying data set, what we disaggregate will be inevitably inaccurate. So that's why the third priority is to ensure data sets are timely and complete. And the fourth priority is to drive secondary prevention interventions. And that is why we've developed the core 20 plus five vehicle to really pick up those big drivers um, of premature mortality. And the final one is to strengthen leadership and accountability. And what we mean by that is that every region, every ICS, every NHS provider, every primary care network, should have a named senior responsible officer for tackling health inequalities so that they are the ones leading the conversation across sectors, across systems to find solutions, not just in terms of healthcare inequalities, but actually in relation to those social determinants. So again, for example, we know that um, um, Birmingham hospitals they brought this fantastic initiative where young people experiencing homelessness were helped into paid work. And they did that by refurbishing some of their old derelict estate. So they were offered work and affordable accommodation. So you can see a great example of how it's not just about health care inequalities, we can work with the rest of the ICS to tackle health inequalities in the social determinants. And the final thing from an ICS point of view, as we build our system accountability framework, it's important that the system accountability framework is cross-referenced to the four aims of the ICS. Otherwise, in five years, how will we know how we are driving? and whether we are on course to achieve the four reasons why the ICS was set up. So the system accountability frameworks need to reference those four aims, which of course includes tackling inequalities. And I will say, as our ICSs are developing their five-year strategy, that we are clear-eyed about the action that each part of the system is going to take and that the system is going to take in collaboration to actually narrow the health inequalities gap. I think those are the practical, tangible things that ICSs can begin to do for us to begin to make some inroad in this space.
Thank you for that. And I'm just going to pick up on a couple of those things, and uh, I can see coming up in the questions as well. There's questions around um, coding, and you mentioned that you know one of the priorities are for data sets to be timely and complete. But given some of the known issue in, in, in getting that data um, adequately coded and, and inputted, how do we how, how do we improve on that given where we are right now? So I think there is responsibility at every level of the system. If I start with frontline healthcare practitioners, my colleagues, we are eminently able, uh, you know, to code people's ethnicity within our electronic patient records. And yes, we may need some support to become more confident in asking people, you know, what is your ethnicity? and not feel shy about doing that by being able to explain to people that we're doing this is because if you're not in the data, it makes it really difficult for us to organize our services in a way that addresses your needs. So as frontline clinicians, we can be mindful of the need to ask the question and code it at a service level across our clinical pathways Again, we can begin to systematically look at whether we're coding, whether that is maternity or mental health, outpatients, community services. We can begin to look and self-assess how complete is our ethnicity data. We can begin to look at the independent sector as the independent sector is doing more work um, in terms of supporting with the recovery of our electives waiting list and taking ownership and responsibility for ethnicity coding and increasing and improving the completeness of that. And then scaling up from that in terms of the conversations we are having at the national level between my team and our colleagues in NHS Digital and others to just make sure that we're able to track the degree of completeness of the data and put in the necessary support for different levels of the system to understand the ask, have the tools to do it, and increase people's wherewithal to improve the level of data coding. So yes, there are challenges to be overcome, but actually I think there is a lot that we are able to do even now. Thank you for that. Um, and just picking up on the other um, uh, the other ask aspect about the accountability framework, would you be able to provide a little bit more uh, detail on what you have in mind there? And I guess my question that is reference to what we talked about earlier around, um, you know, the the goals are ambitious, the eventual overall. So how do we measure the the process of change? Um, you know, what kind of things will suggest that we're making some improvements? I think it's really important that we do both and. I would be saying to my ICS colleagues, let's be unapologetic about focusing on outcome measures. There is a danger that if we focus excessively on process measures, what happens is that then drives even more process rather than actually driving outcomes. Um, there is always a risk that we interpret activity as movement. And that's not necessarily correct. And my hope, my desperate ambition, as we come together as the ICS and drive forward, is that we are ruthless about activity to what end. Every time we set up a new process, to what extent is that process contributing to the overall outcome? So we have said, for example, we want to increase our early cancer diagnosis, diagnosing cancer at stage one or two, 75% of the time. That is the outcome. And therefore, whatever system accountability framework we develop, needs to be able to demonstrate how we are driving towards that goal, not simply count the activity that we are doing. And you can replicate that across any other service line. So it's, it's, it's that relentless focus on outcome measures 
understanding that, of course, we need processes to get there, but to be able to see the trajectory towards the outcome goal so we can course correct if the trajectory tells us that maybe we're not quite on track to the outcome goal that we've set ourselves. It's really important because I think processes are easier to measure. Um, and I, I, I know, for example, in my surgery, it's easier for me to be able to count how many people came through the doors. What's more important is to what degree are we reducing the incidence, for example, of stroke? If I go back to core 20 plus five, one of the clinical focus areas is cardiovascular disease. And we're particularly focused in that space on hypertension case finding, hypertension optimal management, lipid optimal management. What is that in service of? It's to reduce the number of people having heart attacks, reduce the number of people ending up with a stroke because that outcome is catastrophic for the individual and it puts pressure on the NHS in terms of our urgent and emergency care pathways. It puts pressure on social care as a result of disability. And also it's a loss to us as a country because people are then taken out of their productive life as a result of those things. So you will forgive me if I focus the answer on our ICS accountability frameworks need to have outcome measures very clearly outlined. And of course, we will then need to work out the processes to get us there. Great, thank you. That's very clear. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions on the chat and I'm just going to take, uh, I'm going to kind of combine two of them. Um, it's around uh, the assumptions that we are making um, on behalf of our population and then referencing um, something that you, we talked about earlier around the co-production with our communities. How do we engage some of our communities when sometimes we use a lot of jargon? We're, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're trying to address our inequalities, but within doing that, we're, we're using the we're using health um, NHS jargon, which maybe disengages the very people that we're trying to work with. I think it's a really important question. And I think we are getting better. There's always room to improve, but I think we're getting better. I had a wonderful conversation with the amazing Clinton Farkerson, um, who is the chief executive of Think Local, Act Personal, um, about a year ago. And Clinton made a really important point. He said, Bola, I know why you talk about life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, but you need to understand that for many people, it's not just about living longer. It's not just about a life expectancy, it's the quality of life. And you know, we took on board that challenge from Clinton. And so when we set out our vision, the vision is exceptional quality healthcare for all through equitable access, excellent experience and optimal outcomes. So you can see how the vision doesn't say anything about life expectancy or healthy life expectancy. We want to focus on what matters to people in terms of their ability to access services when they need it, the quality of their experience once they get through the door, and of course the outcomes they go on to achieve. And I think that vision statement is a great example of listening to, you know, the voice of a community leader. But actually, if we can focus on those three things, we will ultimately achieve the end goal of improving healthy life expectancy, not just increasing the length of people's lives without the quality. But as I said, there is still a lot we can do and we published recently in collaboration with the Health Foundation, an actionable insight guide with an expert reference group. It includes case studies and it talks about 
how we go about co-producing solutions with our people and communities. And I'm sure um, somebody may find it online as we are talking Abeda and, and help us to drop that um, link into the chat box. We worked with the West Yorkshire Academic Health Science Network, with the Health Foundation and our expert reference group. And I think the report is a great tool to absolutely address that question of how do we systematically co-produce solutions with people and communities? Excellent, thank you. I'm sure someone will put that in the chat. Um, there's another question, um, and um, this one's from Peter Spilsbury. Um, so it's about healthcare inequ inequity and moving resources between populations. How do you make that credible from a kind of uh, NHS point of view? Um, are we talking about leveling up? Are we talking about zero sum or leveling down? And how do we, uh, I'll let you answer that question first and then do some follow-up. Thank you, Peter. That's a great question. And thank you for the Midland CSU's report on inequalities in plant care, um, a toolkit for ICB leaders. Um, for those who may not have read that document, again, I think it's a great one to put in the chat box because it uses some incredibly powerful analytics um, to guide ICS and ICB leaders through the decision-making process. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really great tool. Coming to the question, one of the good things about the way we've gone around funding allocation in the NHS, many people may be aware, and for those who aren't, it's good to be aware that in the CCG funding allocation, there has always been a health inequalities adjustment. And that is in recognition of the health inequalities factor within different groups of the population. As we've gone into the ICS as statutory organization since July this year, that health inequalities adjustment has moved into the ICB baseline. So it's still there. So I think that's a really important thing for, for, for us to note in terms of that adjustment within the ICB's baseline. Also this year, NHS England recognized that in addition to that, if we're going to really support people to restore our NHS services inclusively, particularly in terms of the electives waiting list, we needed to provide additional support and therefore an additional 200 million pounds was made available on a weighted basis as part of the 22-23 funding allocation. I'm calling out these very specific funding lines to say from the centre there is a recognition and effort to acknowledge and provide for health inequalities in the work that we have to do. What I will say though is there something about the decisions we make at system level and at local level and how we find the courage of our conviction to use those various adjustments to address the health inequalities in our population as they were intended. A great example is West Yorkshire. And I really want to put a shout out there to Dr. Sohail Abbas. Um, and the team in Bradford act as one Bradford who have stood up the Reducing Inequalities in Communities program, 27 individual projects being funded using their various health inequalities monies. The other thing that I just want to mention is the 4.2 million that has been released to the 42 ICSs as part of our innovation in health inequalities program in collaboration with the Acce Accelerated Access Collaborative. I also want to mention the wonderful funding from the NIHR, the 50 million pounds health inequalities research funding made available to 13 of our local authorities in some of the most underserved communities and geographies um, in the country. So 
I guess what I'm saying, Abeda, is no, it's not perfect, but yes, there is an acknowledgement of the need and a whole lot of work being done to bend and orientate funding in a way to address those health inequalities. And on the back of that, and picking up another question in the chat, um, we, we've seen a lot of the, and you've given some uh, good examples of um, local systems working together in partnership and working with other agency, but what's the responsibility of at a national level at, with uh, working in partnership with other government departments um, to tackle some of these um, challenges around health in, uh, inequalities? Great question, Abeda. Absolutely. So, as I was saying at the beginning around health inequalities as it pertains to the social determinants in terms of employment and education and so on, we absolutely won't get very far on any of those fronts without working with our colleagues in DWP, for example without working with our colleagues in the Department for Housing, Communities and Leveling Up, for example, or indeed working with our colleagues in the, um, you know, the Department for Education. So if we're going to make any inroads in tackling the wider determinants of health, which drive the biggest proportion of health inequalities, it's an imperative and a given that we have to work with those departments. And I'm pleased to say that actually, we do. So there's a whole range of um, place-based initiatives going on across the country through the Government Place Board, which we are very much connected into, various pieces of work, even beyond government. One of the other things we did in January this year was we called a meeting of business and industry to address the question, what is the role of business? in tackling health inequalities. And out of that round table came the 10 ways. And again, I'm hoping that we'll be able to put that in the chat box. And with our commerce, business and industry partners, through that round table, we were able to come up with 10 key roles that business and industry can play in tackling health inequalities, being mindful of digital inclusion, using their corporate social responsibility vehicle, using their ESG, the work they do on sustainability, outsourcing ethically, staff health and well-being. Those 10 ways that we developed with our business and industry partners in January is a great template for demonstrating the role that others can play in this space. And on the back of that, I'm delighted that only last week, um, the CBI, working with Business for Health, published the Health Index, which I would really commend um, to people um, on the call and to please share more widely. Another really important tool that can help employers to assess themselves across a whole range of parameters, how they're driving in supporting their employees. I think it's this super matrix, I call it a super matrix of us working with government departments, with business and industry, with our voluntary and charitable sector colleagues, with our local authority colleagues. It's that super matrix that ultimately will move the dial in the right direction, both for the social determinants and healthcare inequalities. Thank you, brother. Um, just one last question. I know you've got uh, clinical duties to get back to. Um, so one last question from Dan uh, Potwell. Um, he points out that the NHS currently spends 3.7% uh, of its uh, uh, annual 157 billion budget on prevention and only nine and, and the rest of it, the 96.3 on treating people who are already ill. Um, do you th see those percentages shifting in the near future um, to, to, with this uh, agenda? If we look at the NHS long-term plan published in 2019, a huge number of commitments in that to prevention, and that's being driven forward, whether that is in the diabetes prevention program, which I'm delighted to say has absolutely demonstrated impact already, 
in terms of reducing the incidence of diabetes, particularly in our ethnic minority populations and some of our most deprived populations. The commitments made in terms of weight management, which again are services that have continued even through the pandemic, um, you know, as a result of going digital. The work that is being done in terms of tobacco cessation, particularly in our inpatient wards, especially in mental health, we all know that the 15 to 20 year life expectancy gap that people with severe mental illness experience is largely in part due to preventable illness with smoking being a key contributor to that. So the NHS has demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate the commitment you know, to, to, to secondary prevention in particular um, around all of those dimensions. And even more recently, in addition to all those really important pieces of work around tobacco control, around diabetes prevention, around weight management, the more recent um, secondary prevention interventions that we also described within the core 20 plus five frame, which focuses more on underserved populations in addition to the overall prevention work that was already being done across the wider population, including in cardiovascular disease, in respiratory disease, in you know, aortic fibrillation, being able to diagnose that earlier, prevent people going on to have a stroke. So I think I will sign post colleagues to the long-term plan from 2019 to see the huge range of interventions that the NHS set out for prevention and tackling health inequalities. And many of those are already in train and that is only going to amplify as we go forward from here. Great, thank you, Bala. Um, that really is all the time we have in terms of the questions. Bala, is there anything else that you wanted to add to our um, discussion that you did have an opportunity to, uh, to say? Thank you, Abeda. I think I'm going to um, summarize um, the conversation we've had and many thanks to colleagues for, for joining us and thank you for the invitation. Look, I think we need to be clear eyed about the fact that we are at the foothills. We have an enormous amount of work to do. Having said that, we have a huge amount that we have already done that we can build on. We all together did extraordinary work during the COVID pandemic. And we can find resilience by building on that, building on our partnerships across the ICS, building on our partnership with the communities that we're trying to serve, building our partnership with the individuals that we're trying to serve, and that we do three things. They're the three things we did in the pandemic that has really stood us well. We developed a different relationship with data. We democratized our data. We elevated the timeliness of data. And we used the data to gain actionable insight. And we drove interventions on that. Second thing we did, we took a strength-based approach. We didn't focus relentlessly on everything that was going wrong. We began to focus on what we were doing well and the strengths of our communities, the assets of our communities, and we built on that. And the third thing we did, we co-produced the solutions with our people and with our communities. I am absolutely confident that if we can build on those wonderful sources of resilience and do those three things, we have hope. We can narrow the gap, even starting from these foothills where we are now. Thank you, Bala. Thank you. Uh, a fantastic summary and a fantastic conversation overall. Um, thank you for making the time um, in your very busy schedule um, to join, to take part. We're very, very grateful. And thank you everybody else as well for joining us. I'm sure some of you want to leave to um, join the football or watch the football. 
Um, but before you leave, just a quick reminder of the sessions that are coming up next week in week two of our Insight Festival. And uh, apologies to all my strategy unit colleagues, but I am going to plug my own session next week. So if you're interested in health inequalities, if you want to further this uh, discussion, we've got a very special session um, addressing gendered ageing. Uh, on Monday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, I'll be joined by some fabulous colleagues um, in a panel discussion, and we're going to be discussing the impact of the menopause on the NHS workforce, so very specific. Um, it's uh, the strategy unit of the health economics own work. Uh, we've done the science and the analysis, and we're looking to our wider healthcare colleagues to craft decisions based on our findings that will benefit all of us working within the NHS. Uh, that's, the, that's the promotional plug for me. Have a great weekend and see you all on Monday, I hope.